Okay, uh, welcome everyone to uh, the end of the derivative and the beginning of the integral. So, we're going to come back to unite these two units later, but for right now we're starting a completely different section of calculus, the integral. So what is the integral? Okay, well first to understand the integral the same way how we understood the derivative, we have a limit definition to uh, look at first. For the derivative we had the difference quotient, for the integral we're going to have the Riemann sum. Okay. Now for the derivative, we used a limit definition to get closer and closer to an instantaneous rate of change. The integral, we're getting closer and closer to the area under a curve. So let me draw that out for you guys. What an integral is, is let's say I have y equals x squared. The integral is you're going to provide it to x values, let's say x equals 1 and x equals 5. And what the integral will do is it will give you the area underneath the curve for y equals x squared as the top, the x-axis as the bottom, and these two x values as either side. So this integral is what's going to allow you to find the area of shapes of which one side is curved arbitrarily. But you're able to model one side of the curve with a function. All right, now you'll see that applied in pretty much most graphs. Let's say if I drew a graph of um, where velocity is the y-axis and time is the x-axis, okay? So this is gonna be in units of meters per second and time is gonna be in units of seconds. And I drew such a, there's such a relationship between the two. Then if I wanted the integral, if I wanted the area under the curve from here to here, let's say from zero, to 5, x equals 0 to x equals 5, you'll notice that's just a triangle. But the area is not what I want you to pay attention to. I want you to pay attention to the fact that this is an accumulation of change. Now let me show you what I mean by that. An accumulation of change means how is the graph changing over all of this period of time right here, 0 to 5, okay? So if we do an integral, and if we find the area under the curve here, by the way, this is the symbol for the integral, if none of you uh, knew. If we do an integral here and we find the area under the curve, we realize that since this is a triangle, we could have found it by doing the formula for a triangle. The base, 0, uh, 5 minus 0, times the height, which is 5, because this is y equals x. So that becomes 5 times 5, all over 2, because this is a triangle. And that gives us 25 over 2, is the area contained within this triangle. Okay, so the height of the graph, the y-coordinates of the graph, was in meters per second. Five meters per second times the bottom of the graph, which is in units of seconds, times five seconds, all over two gives us 25 over two meters, okay? What the integral is conceptually doing is the integral is looking at the graph and it says, okay, if my velocity can be modeled as this, how far did I go from zero to five? From time equals zero to time equals five. The integral answers the question of, okay, I'm traveling at a non-constant velocity, how far will I travel in the next five seconds? 
It's an accumulation of the graph. Okay? You'll see conceptually what it means as you try and take on more problems. But just know that the units for an integral will always be the inverse of the units for a derivative. So the integral takes away one unit of time. So you saw here that uh, this was originally in meters per second and we got meters. In the derivative, if this was in meters per second, we would have gotten meters per second squared. Okay, Let's move on here to past what it means, which you're going to see demonstrated in more and more practice problems. How do we find it? So the Riemann sum states that we can approximate the area under a curve, let's say between 0 and 5 again, by drawing tiny rectangles within the curve. Okay, and if we draw a bunch of tiny rectangles, we're going to be able to get kind of close to what the actual area under the curve is. And we all know how to find the areas of rectangles. So if we just find the area of a bunch of rectangles, then we might be able to get a pretty close approximation of what's under the curve. But you guys can see here, there's little areas, there's little pockets between the rectangles and the actual curve. And that's why it's just an approximation. It's not the actual area under the curve. But if we were to, on this side, let's say, draw many more rectangles, and if we draw many more rectangles in the same width, that means the rectangles are much thinner. And if the rectangles are much thinner, we decrease the area of error. More rectangles means less error between the area and the function. Okay, so the clear path from there is what if we have an infinite amount of rectangles? If we have an infinite amount of rectangles, the error should converge to zero, which it does, okay? So the limit definition of the area under the curve is uh, what that what is the area of all the rectangles as the number of rectangles approaches infinity? And if you might be able to see, as the number of rectangles approaches infinity, the width of each rectangle approaches zero. And so that is written uh, as such. So that's pretty much the formula for our Riemann sum. Now, let's interpret what all of these values mean. The limit as n goes to infinity, n here designates, n designates our number of rectangles. Okay. This term right here, the delta x sub n, delta x, as we should know by now, represents our change in x. So here, one of our bounds was 0 and the other bound was 5, therefore our change in x is 5 minus 0 is 5. Change in x is 5. Okay? And if our total change in x is 5, we need to divide that by the total number of rectangles we have. If we divide the total distance by the total number of rectangles, then we get the width of each rectangle. Okay, so this is the width of each rectangle, and f of x sub n, this term right here, is the value of the function f of x evaluated at whatever rectangle we're on at that moment, okay? That would be the height of a rectangle. And because, as you can see here, the height is constantly changing, it's the height of the rectangle evaluated at the certain rectangle we're on. Okay? So it's the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum 
of all of the uh, height times width, width times height, of each rectangle. Pretty, pretty self-explanatory. I, mean, I think you can see that. Now, unlike the difference quotient, the Riemann sum will very often show up on the Calc BC exam, and it will very often be an FRQ. So you need to pay attention to what exactly uh, the Riemann sum will demonstrate. Now, the Riemann sum as a limit will not show up on uh, the FRQ. The Riemann sum as a crude approximation will show up, okay? The same way how average rate of change shows up, but limit definition of the derivative does not show up, okay? The secant line is to the tangent line as the uh, Riemann sum is to the limit definition, okay? One's an approximation, one's uh, an exact value, okay? So the way uh, the crude Riemann sum appears on the FRQ is they will often give you a table of values, okay? And it will often be something like x here, f of x down here, you've got 1, 4, 5, 8, something along those lines, irregular uh, differences, and you're going to get some f of x values, 1, uh, 6, 12, 14. The uh, FRQ will ask you to use a left or right or midpoint or trapezoidal Riemann sum uh, with this table of values. Now let's get into what all of those are for just a moment. You have got a left Riemann sum. A left Riemann sum is where the left corner of the rectangle touches the function and the right corner of the rectangle uh, incurs the error a right Riemann sum is where the right side of the rectangle touches the function and the left side incurs the error. You've got a midpoint Riemann sum where the middle of the uh, rectangle touches the function, and uh, the left and right side both incur an inverse amount of error, like the left side here incurs an overestimate, and the right side here incurs an underestimate of the function. Okay, so the formula for the midpoint Riemann sum is you're given an x value here, we're going to call this x1, you're given an x value here, x2, and you take x2 minus x1, over 2, and that gives you the change in x between those two x values over 2. And so you just take the change in x over 2 plus x1, x sub 1, and that gives you this x value right here. Okay, and that's the middle x value between the two x values, and then you just evaluate f of x there, and that gives you your center of the rectangle on the function. And the last kind of Riemann sum is the trapezoidal Riemann sum. The trapezoidal Riemann sum is an even closer approximation. Let me show you what that looks like. Trapezoidal Riemann sum has the left corner on the function and the right corner on the function, and it draws a straight line between them. You'll see that the straight line between them is not exactly on the function because the function's a curve, but it's still a much closer approximation than any of the other rectangles. And the formula for a trapezoidal Riemann sum is f of x2, which is 
this uh, y value uh, plus f of x 1, this y value all over 2. That gives you the average height of the rectangle. <clears throat> gives you average height of the rectangle. And so you just multiply that by your change in x to get the full area of the rectangle. Okay. So now that we know what all the Riemann sums are, let's get back to this uh, example table of values. The uh, FRQ will ask you, okay, from x equals 1 to x equals 8, evaluate, let's say, a left Riemann sum with one, two, three subintervals. Okay, subintervals is just a fancy way of saying rectangles with three rectangles because you're only able to draw three rectangles with this table of values, okay? And because it's a left Riemann sum, a left Riemann sum has the left corner touching the graph, okay? So with a left Riemann sum, we would take uh, the width, the first width of our first rectangle is this distance, which is 3. So we would take 3 times our first height, which is 1 here. Which is 1 here. Plus our second width, which in this case is 1, times our second height, which is 6 plus our third width, which is 3, plus our third height, which is 12. Okay, if this was a right Riemann sum, then 6 would be your first height, 12 would be your second height, and 14 would be your third height. That would be for a right Riemann sum, because if you draw a rectangle with one corner at x equals 1 and the other corner at x equals 4, then the right height would be at y equals 6. See what I mean here? Okay. So once we evaluate this, we just do some simple multiplication and addition, and then we would say that the area under the curve from x equals 1 to x equals 8 is approximately uh, 3 plus 6 plus 36, which is 45, I think? Yes, 45. Remember not to write a hard equal sign. Remember not to write out in words equals is equivalent to. Make sure if you're writing it in words, use the word approximately. If you're writing it out in math notation, use the squiggly equal sign, because it's it's not exactly 45. Remember, this is an approximation. Like I hinted at before, the Riemann sum, the limit as the number of rectangles approaches infinity of the summation of all the rectangles, the rectangles being f of x sub n times change in x over n, eventually converges when n goes to infinity, it's the same thing as a definite integral. Okay? You might be asking yourself, what, he just said integral before, why is he saying definite integral now? You'll see in just a moment there, there's a definite integral and there is an indefinite integral, and we're going to cover indefinite integrals later. So this becomes a definite integral of f of x dx from a to b. Now I'm going to cover exactly what all of these little uh, symbols mean, okay? So this is your integral symbol, this uh, squiggly bar. A, if I draw our function here, A would be the lower bound B would be the upper bound, the left and right bound of the area. 
f of x is of course your function and dx is what I was referencing earlier over here. Okay. We covered back in the derivative unit that delta x, which is a change in x, uh, as it becomes infinitely small, becomes dx. Delta x means change in x, dx means infinitely small change in x. Okay? And if we look here, a change in x over infinity becomes an infinitely small change in x. And the infinitely small change in x is the width of our rectangle. So that's what this dx means. Okay? So in the same way that we would write dy dx, and that would mean the derivative of y with respect to x, we would write here the, in the definite integral of f of x from a to b with respect to x, okay? This dx, when you say it, when you read this out loud, it's the integral of f of x with respect to x. If this was f of t, for example, then you would have to write dt, the integral of f of t with respect to t. We're going to introduce how the integral itself is related to the derivative, okay? And this will come up again when we cover the indefinite integral, but right now we're just sticking with the definite integral, okay? The definite integral a to b of f of x dx is equal to the antiderivative of b minus the antiderivative of f evaluated at a. Okay? So let me tell you exactly what that means. If f of x, or let's say x squared, then we would take the antiderivative, we would anti-differentiate it, we would go backwards, okay? Now, we're going to cover all of the antiderivative rules in just a moment, but I think you guys can use your brains to figure out that uh, if before x squared, the derivative of x squared was 2x, because we brought the 2 down, it would make sense that to find the antiderivative of f of x, we would raise the exponent by 1 and then divide by that exponent, okay? And you can check your work by differentiating this. Equals, we bring down the 3, 3 over 3 x squared, which is the same as 1 x squared, okay? So we're going to go further into depth with all of the different antiderivative rules, but what I want to get across to you right here is this postulate. If f of x equals x squared, and let's say we're trying to evaluate the integral from a to b of x squared dx, that would equal x to the third over 3 evaluated at b, minus x to the third over 3 evaluated at a, okay? Now we have a new integral notation for that, and we would write that as x to the third over 3 in square brackets b to a, evaluated from a to b, okay? This means the same thing as this. This means evaluate What's it, whatever's inside the square brackets at B, evaluate whatever's in the square brackets at A, and do B minus A. f of x equals x squared. Let's say A is 1, B is 5. Evaluate the area under the curve from 1 to 5. So that would be written the area under the curve from 1 to 5 of x squared dx. And then you would take the antiderivative, x to the third over 3, 
evaluated from 5 to 1. <clears throat> and then you do that out, which would be 125 over 3 minus 1 over 3. Yes? Yes? And that would equal 124 over 3, which is not divisible by 3, I don't think. No. And that would be your answer. That would be the area of this part of the graph. Okay. So let's get into all of our antiderivative rules. Okay, so you've got the anti-power rule, which you have just seen demonstrated, where if you've got some function x to the a, antiderivative of x to the a dx equals x to the a plus 1. Remember, we're integrate, we're uh, adding 1 to the power divided by a plus 1. The integral of any constant a dx always equals ax. The integral of any constant ax dx can be manipulated. The constant can be taken out of the integral sign to show a times the integral of x dx. I also got if I've got the, the definite integral from a to b of f of x plus g of x dx, that can become the integral a to b of f of x plus the integral a to b g of x dx. Don't forget your dx. Uh, we've got splitting up the uh, bounds of integration where if you've got the integral from a to c, f of x dx, that is the same as the integral from a to b of f of x dx plus the integral from b to c of f of x dx. Of course, this same rule up here also applies with subtraction, as did with derivatives. Pretty much all of the same rules that apply to derivatives apply to integrals, except uh, when you, we deal with the more complex rules like uh, the quotient, product, chain rule, etc., etc., things like that. And so the sort of be all end all for integral rules is uh, sort of what would I have to differentiate? to get this. Like if I was trying to find the antiderivative of sine x, if I was trying to find the antiderivative of sine x so I could evaluate this. You would think, okay, what would I have to take the derivative of to get sine x? Well, if I take the derivative of cosine x, then I get negative sine. But if I take, okay, if I take the derivative of cosine x, then I get negative sine. Now that we know this, we can use a manipulation of this rule, okay? If I'm dealing with the, uh, integral from a to b, sine x dx, then here I've got an invisible 1 as a constant multiple to the function, okay? We know 1 is equal to negative 1 over negative 1, right? So I can say this is equal to integral from a to b of negative 1 over negative 1 sine x dx which is equal to negative 1, we take this guy and bring it on the outside, negative 1 times the integral of 1 over negative 1 sine x dx, which is the same as negative 1 integral a to b of negative sine x dx, because 1 over negative 1 equals negative 1. 
And now that I have this in my integral, now that this is my integrand, I can find the antiderivative. We say this is negative cosine x. Evaluated a to b. Okay. The hardest part about learning integration for starters is sort of familiarizing yourself with all of the so anti-differentiation rules and sort of training your mind to think backwards, which isn't always easy. And so two, just two more of the uh, basic uh, integration rules before we move on. Uh, if we've got the integral from a to a of f of x dx, that's always zero because your delta x here is zero, you're changing x, the width of all of your rectangles is actually zero. And so if you have a width of zero, when you try to multiply that by a length, it's always going to be zero. And uh, if you've got the integral from a to b, f of x dx, that equals the negative integral from b to a of f of x dx. So just two more of the basic uh, integral rules. And uh, next we're going to do the other half of the fundamental theorem of calculus, which starts us with indefinite integrals. Okay, so the second start of the fun the second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus uh, states that the indefinite integral, which is an integral without bounds, without a to b on the top and bottom, the antiderivative of f of x dx is just equal to the antiderivative of f of x plus some constant c, okay? Now, the reason for that being is if we take a derivative, we take the derivative of x plus 1, that's going to equal 1, okay? But if we try to take the antiderivative of 1 dx, we're going to get 1x plus some constant c, which we don't know, okay? That c could be anything. It could be 1, which is what our original function was. But if we were not given the original function, then we would have no way of knowing what that constant was, okay? So... The gist of the fundamental theorem of calculus states that if you take the derivative of an integral of f of x dx, that is f of x. The derivative and the integral are inverses. One differentiates, one anti-differentiates. They're like division and multiplication are inverses, like squaring something and square rooting are inverses. The integral and the derivative are inverses. Okay? So, that brings us to another very popular FRQ. Sometimes this FRQ shows up twice on a BC exam, like out of the, I'm not sure if it's eight or nine FRQs. Anyway, they usually pull up uh, FRQs like this, what I'm about to show you twice. And that's called, uh, the type of FRQ is called uh, Fundamental Theorem of Calculus Graph Problem. Okay, where they might give you any graph. This, let's say this is the graph of F. It could be any graph. It could be straight lines with discontinuities. It could be curvy lines, etc., etc. But they're going to give you the graph of F. And they're going to tell you that G of X equals antiderivative of f of x dx. And what that tells you is that g prime of x equals f of x. Alright, so remember this is the graph of f that we'll be given in the FRQ. And all of the questions, part a, b, c, etc, etc, 
will ask you questions about g of x. So you need to be able to make the distinction that you're looking at a graph of the derivative of g of x. Okay, so one question might look like, uh, where does g of x, where does g of x incur a maximum, a relative maximum? Where does g of x occur a relative, a relative maximum? So g of x incurs a relative maximum when g prime goes from positive to negative. And that happens right here. Most kids, they see g of x and they don't make the distinction that they're looking at a graph of g prime. So they say this is the relative maximum because they did not make the connection that this is in fact the graph of the derivative, not a graph of the original function. Another would state on what intervals is uh, g of x increasing, and that would just be where g prime is positive, where this graph is positive. Okay. Very common type of FRQ, usually pretty easy. If you understand the basics of this is a derivative, this is an integral, how do they relate? One undoes the other. If I'm looking at a graph of f prime, how do I uh, interpret this with reference to f of x? If I'm given f of x, how do I reference this with, referen with uh, respect to f double prime of x? and it's just relating all of the derivatives visually on a graph. These ones you're probably going to need a good amount of practice with because they can ask a lot of different types of stuff, but the gist of, you, gist of it should be pretty simple to understand from here. Anyway, moving on. Like I uh, referenced before, there are a lot of other antiderivative rules that have to deal with the other more complex derivative rules, okay? So, uh, you may or may not have noticed back in the derivatives unit that um, the quotient rule is completely obsolete, okay? If I have uh, f of x equals 1 equals x plus 2, over x squared, and you wanted to find f prime of x, you would logically do quotient rule. But what you could also do is you could say you could break this up into x plus 2 times 1 over x squared, and you could do product rule and chain rule. Because this is a product, and 1 over x squared is uh, 1 over x is your outside function, and x squared is your inside function. And you would do chain rule there. Okay? The reason I tell you that now is because in uh, integrals, we don't have an anti-quotient rule and an anti-product rule. We just have an anti-product rule. Okay. So, um, the most common introduction to uh, the integral rules is done with this rule called U substitution. And U substitution is pretty much the anti chain rule. Okay? U substitution works like this I'm given the integral cosine x squared times x dx. Okay? It's a pretty complex integral. U substitution states that I need to be able to point out a function whose derivative is also present. Okay? I see x squared and I see x. The derivative of x squared is 2x. Okay, how do I make the derivative of x squared present? I take this 1 over 1, or 2 over 2, this invisible 2 over 2 that exists in the integral of cosine 
x squared times x dx, and I put one half on the outside, and I keep the two on the inside, and now I have a 2x. Okay? Now, I find a function whose derivative is also present. I, I do the substitution, let's say u equals x squared. Okay? du would equal 2x dx. A function whose derivative is also present. Therefore, this integral right here becomes 1 half times the integral of cosine x squared, which becomes u, as we've defined right here, multiplied by hmm, 2x dx, 2x dx. We can perform the substitution times du. Okay. Well, look what we've got here. Don't be scared by u's in your integral. It's the same as having x's in your integral. Let's see, what is the antiderivative of cosine u? The antiderivative of cosine u is sine u. The derivative of sine u is cosine u. Oh, no, we're not done. Because we're wanted to find the antiderivative as a function of x, not a function of u. So what do you do from here? You just substitute back in. We're given here u equals x squared. This equals sine of x squared. u is just a placeholder. We just substitute it back in when we need it. So that's u substitution. Let's see, what else do we need? Ah, integration by long division. Okay. Um, Let's say I give you integral of x minus 5 over 2x plus 2 dx. And I asked you evaluate the integral. What you would do is you would set this up like long division. You would try to work this out because this is a division bar here. You would put 2x plus... Uh, 2 on the inside, x minus 5 on the outside. Okay. We do out the long division. I hope you guys remember long division from pre-calc. And that would become 12. So this would become the same thing as 2 plus 12 over 2x plus 2. This becomes uh, 2x plus the integral 12 over 2x plus 2 dx. This becomes 2x plus the integral of 6 over x plus 1 dx which becomes 2x plus 6 times the natural log of the absolute value of x plus 1. Okay, so that's an important distinction that we need to make. The antiderivative of 1 over x dx is the natural log of the absolute value of x. Okay. It's just a rule you're going to have to memorize. It makes sense because the natural log of x goes like this and it's only defined on the right side of the graph. However, 1 over x is defined on both sides of the graph. So we need its derivative to be defined on both sides of the graph. How do we do that? We take the absolute value of ln x, which looks like that. I know it's hard to see. Absolute value of ln x looks like that. Another integral rule is uh, anti-trig. So um, one of the more popular ones you're going to be seeing 
is uh, the antiderivative of 1 over x squared plus 1, or something in that form. dx equals tan x. Because if you remember, if we take the derivative of both sides, that gets rid of this. That's the derivative rule for tan x. Okay. So, that brings us to our next topic, which is integrating by completing the square. So, if I'm given the integral of, let's say, x squared plus um, 2x plus 14, what we would do here with the denominator is we would try to complete the square. So our goal here is to get x squared plus 2x plus 1. And therefore, we could get that by subtracting 13 from both sides. So this equals antiderivative of x squared plus 2x plus 1 plus 13 as seen here, okay? Which can be rewritten, since we completed the square, as x plus 1 squared plus 13. And that would equal, let's divide uh, the bottom by 13, that would give us x plus 1 squared over 13 plus 1, and that can be rewritten as 1 over x plus 1 over rad 13 all squared plus 1. And now we can see that this is in the form of this. Okay, let's make sure that this is just a first order function, that we don't need to do any u substitution, which it is. This equals tan of x plus 1 over rad 13. <sighs> this type of integration and this type of integration are two of the rarer kinds of integration. Like these will usually only show up on multiple choice, sometimes very rarely as a subpart of an FRQ. Uh, next, what we've got to do is um, a method called integration by parts. Integration by parts. Now, integration by parts is your anti-product rule, okay? So, the understanding of this rule is pretty simple. We were given that a function f of x times g of x, the derivative of such a function equals f prime x times g of x plus g prime x times f of x. Now if we want to go backwards, we just integrate both sides. We get f of x times g of x equals the integral of f prime x times g of x plus dx, don't forget your dx, plus g prime x times f of x dx. And if we manipulate that around, and we, we can rewrite it as the integral of g prime x times f of x dx equals f of x times g of x minus the integral of f prime x times g of x dx. So this is your integration by parts formula. You can see that once I was here, I just moved this to the other side, and we got this equation. Now, for me, I could never remember this in a million years. I, I do not have the integration by parts formula memorized. 
I literally derive it out every time I need to use it. I literally say, okay, what's the product rule? Let me integrate the product rule and let me get this formula. I could not memorize this for the life of me. And uh, if you have trouble with memorizing things, I suggest you do the same. So let me give you guys an example for a common problem they use for integration by parts. They usually give a problem that looks just like this on at least one of the multiple choice questions on every BC exam. It'll usually be in the form of the integral of x times cosine x or x times sine x. The processes are pretty much the same, so we're going to stick with x times cosine x. Okay. If you look closely at it for long enough, you realize you can't use u substitution or any of the other integral rules we've learned yet. So we got to use integration by parts. Okay. So this right here is the integral you start with. Okay. Now the key to using integration by parts is to identify which of these functions you want to be your g prime x and which of these functions you want to be your f of x. And the way you decide that is you look over on the right side of the formula and you say, okay, I need to select which one's which based off of the choice that will make this function, this integral, the easiest to evaluate. Your goal is to make this integral the easiest to evaluate. Okay? You see that it contains an f prime x and a g of x. Okay. If I set x equal to f of x, f prime x is 1. Therefore, if f prime x is 1, this entire term cancels out, and now I'm just left with a g of x. That would make this integral much easier to evaluate. So that's what we're going to do. Okay, that's the type of process you need to reason your way through every time you do an integration by parts problem. Now, I would highly recommend that you draw out a little chart of what, what functions are what. So we set f of x equal to x and f prime x equal to 1. Uh, we set g prime x equal to cosine x and g of x, its antiderivative, would be negative sine x, just sine x, excuse me, just sine x. And now we can just plug into our formula. f of x times g of x. Therefore, this integral equals f of x times g of x, which is x times sine x, minus the integral of f prime x, which is 1, times g of x, which is sine x. Equals x times sine x, minus the antiderivative of sine x is negative cosine x, x times sine x plus cosine x. And that would be your final answer. Now it's always a good idea to go back and check by differentiating this and see if you get your initial, uh, original integrand. So um, let's bring this over here. x times sine x plus cosine x. If we take that derivative. Uh, where it's product rule here, this equals x times cosine x minus uh, sine x, right? No, it's plus sine x. So that's this portion right here. And the uh, plus cosine x, the derivative of cosine x is negative sine. So these two terms cancel out, plus and minus sine, and we're left with x times cosine x, which is exactly the integrand that we had right here. That's integration by parts. So moving on to the uh, last integral rule that you guys are going to be uh, learning here. It's a pretty straightforward rule, but it's extremely time consuming, okay? So if you just pay attention and follow along and be patient, you should be able to see what I'm doing here. So this, um, this problem is called integration by partial fraction decomposition. So let me give you a little practice problem here. And we're going to do this on the antiderivative 
2x plus 3 over x minus 3, x plus 3. dx. Okay, what do we do now? First step is to realize you can't use anything you used before. First step is always identifying which rule you need to use. Once we know we need to use partial fraction decomposition, it's usually obvious because uh, you have a denominator that can, is, is either factorable or factored for you. Okay, that's when you can use partial fraction decomposition. So, as the name suggests, we need to decompose this, uh, we need to decompose this fraction into two fractions with different denominators, okay? And what I mean by that is we need to set this fraction equal to some numerator a over x minus 3 plus some numerator b over x plus 3. Okay? There exists some two fractions that when added together produce this, okay? And our job is to find this. Our job is to separate this fraction out into two fractions. Okay? The reason for that being is we can take the antiderivative of something over x minus 3, and that's just the natural log of the absolute value of x minus 3 times the numerator. This is something we can compute using uh, the antiderivative of natural log, but we need to get here first. So the way we do that is we start with this equation, a over x minus 3 plus b over x plus 3 equals 2x plus 3 over x minus 3, x plus 3. Now it would be a lot easier for us if we had common denominators, which we can do a times x plus 3 over x minus 3, x plus 3, see what I just did here, plus b x minus 3 over x plus 3, x minus 3. So I just multiplied by the same, fra the same uh, terms on top and bottom to keep the same fractions equivalent, but now we've got common denominators with everything. This is now something we can work with, x minus 3, x plus 3. So the next step is to expand out our numerators, distribute. We've got ax plus 3a plus bx minus 3b. And since all of these have common denominators, we just add up the numerators to get the final numerator. So this is the first numerator plus the second numerator equals the third numerator. I hope this makes sense from pre -cal. Okay, so from there we can isolate all of the constant terms and all of the x terms as such. We can say ax plus bx, the two x terms, equal the x term on the other side, and we can say 3a minus 3b equals 3. The two constant terms equals the constant on the right side. And right here, we've got a systems of equations. Our first step here is we can rewrite the x system of equations as just a plus b equals 2, because the x terms are irrelevant now since they're present in all terms. We can just divide both sides by x and get that. And we, we solve for one of our variables. We can say a equals 2 minus b. And we could plug that into our second equation, uh, 3 times 2 minus b minus 3b equals 3. 6 minus 3b minus 3b equals 3. 6 minus 6b equals 3. Subtract 6 from both sides, negative 6b equals negative 3. b equals 1 half. Now we've solved for one of our letters, time to solve for the other one, a, a plus one half equals two, a equals 1.5. There you go, we've solved for our two letters. Now we can go back to our original integral and say, uh, we can bring it down here. 
So the integral of 2x plus 3 over x minus 3, x plus 3, dx, is the same as the integral of, let's say here, a is 1.5, 1.5 over x minus 3, dx, plus the integral of b, which is 0 0.5 over x plus 3, dx. And you see, we were able to separate this out into two separate integrals because of the addition property we went over earlier. And now we've got two integrals that we're capable of solving. So we bring these down here, and this becomes 1.5 times the integral 1 over x minus 3 dx plus 0 0.5 times the integral 1 over x plus 3 dx and that becomes 1.5 times the natural log of the absolute value of x minus 3 plus 0 0.5 times the natural log of the absolute value of x plus 3. And that's your final answer. You see how much work this is? This took up half of my whiteboard. It's a lengthy process, and because it's such a lengthy process, uh, the, the uh, AP exam designers make sure this is never used on an FRQ because you would run out of time. But it's usually pretty prevalent on multiple choice. Okay. Um, so right here, if you're studying for your test tomorrow on integrals and it's just on integrals, then you're pretty much done. Okay, there's one more topic after this called improper integrals. And that's uh, going, where the reason we're learning improper integrals now is because it's essential knowledge for something in a later unit. But it's not essential to your understanding of integrals right now, okay? So if you want to stick around and actually learn the rest of BC with me, then please. What is an improper integral? Well, I'll show you. An improper integral is a definite integral with a finite number as one bound and infinity as another bound of f of x dx. Okay, so that's an improper integral. You can't write it because infinity is not a number. A definite integral needs finite number bounds. So you, this is incorrect. You can't write this. What you can instead write is you can write the limit as b approaches infinity of the integral of 5 to b of f of x dx. Okay? That's correct notation. Okay. So let me give you an example of improper integrals. Uh, let's say uh, we've got the limit as b approaches infinity of 5 to b of x dx, okay? So that would be um, the limit as b approaches infinity of x squared over 2 minus 5 squared over 2, okay? That's simple definite integral uh, fundamental theorem of calculus rule. The definite integral is equal to the antiderivative of the uh, integrand evaluated at the upper bound subtracted from the uh, integrand evaluated at the lower bound. Okay, we can evaluate this limit. I'm sure we know uh, what how this works. This converges to infinity, or excuse me, diverges to infinity. And we subtract from that 25 over 2, and that equals infinity. Okay? If you evaluate an improper integral and it diverges to infinity, you can say the integral diverges. However, we've got special types of integrals that you'll, uh, you'll see very prevalent in our series unit. That's what this mainly ties into. 5 uh, to b of, let's call it 1 over x squared dx. Now that would evaluate down to the limit as b approaches infinity of negative 1 over b minus or plus 1 over 5. 
Okay, so the limit as b goes to infinity of this, it's when the denominator approaches infinity. So this converges to zero plus one fifth equals one fifth. And that's your area under the curve. Okay, so now you can say the integral converges to a certain value, in this case, one fifth. Now, let me show you exactly what that means graphically. Okay, let's say you are drawing one over x squared. It would look something like, no, it would look something like this. Okay, and if we're trying to evaluate the area under the curve from five to infinity, as we are, this is one bound, and the other bound just keeps going further and further until the end of the graph. Okay? And we've just seen that this area between the curve and the x-axis is finite. The area is one-fifth. What that means is that we have found a two-dimensional area with a finite area, but an infinite length. Think about that. We have an infinite length, but a finite area. I found that really interesting when I first thought about it. Well, anyway, guys, enjoy life.